Disruptors and curious minds, welcome to another episode of Thinking on Paper. My name's Jeremy. This is Mark. Guess Hello. what? Guess what, guys? Each week we get to talk to amazing founders, amazing builders, amazing disruptors, building the new pieces and parts that will power our future. And we get to figure out what it is before it happens. This is why it's so exciting. <laughs> today, today we get to talk about uh, sensing and perception technologies as it relates to the combination with AI to make cars better drivers than humans, uh, which is really interesting. Mark, Mark, you said in our pre-pro chat that you are a terrible driver. Like what makes you so terrible? Um, I'm a terrible driver. Yeah, what makes it so terrible is that sometimes I think I'm an awesome driver. Ooh, and that's that, dangerous. That is Super a, dangerous. A, a dangerous combination. Um, honestly, I think I've been driving. I passed my test when I was as soon as I could. It, like the, to cut the car for me was freedom. I was seventeen in the, England. Took my test, passed it, and I think I have this. Oh, I've been driving for twenty years. I'm a really good driver, but in reality, maybe I've been driving for twenty years. I've got loads of bad habits. I think I'm better than I am. Um, I've got two kids, and I was saying in the pre chat as well. Well, I'm very fearful of when they learn to drive. The roads, the roads are dangerous. They're more dangerous than war zones, natural disasters. They're more dangerous than your kitchen. Like, uh, <laughs> and today's guest is going to hopefully explain how AI and sensors can make the roads safer. So, I'm so, to so bef yeah, before you introduce our, our awesome guest, I ran across a study, and I think this was around 2009. This is to help you, Mark, because this you could be okay. you could be a part of these people. Uh, okay. There was a study done in, two, in 2009 that was published in Cerebral Cortex, which has got to be a good spot. For <laughs> That's the public. name of a magazine. Cerebral. No, I think it's a journal. I think it's a okay. medical journal. Awesome. Um, the, the problem is the sample size was very small, 29 people. So let's let's add the credence we can we can give the study that has 29 the size of 29 as a sample size. But they say bad driving can actually be genetic. And there is a uh, a variant called val 66 met that's that's if it manifests in your genome you are actually predisposed to be a 30 percent worse driver than someone else that doesn't have that variation so it could be genetic it's not your fault it's not your fault all right mark let's 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 introduce our guest fire away yeah our, our guest today is barry lund ceo and founder of provisio um and yeah Welcome to the show, Barry. Just before we go, Jeremy, you forgot to mention our new sponsors this week. Oh, that's right. So, so this week, uh, Thinking on Paper is powered by human conversation. Not just any human conversation, but meaningful human conversation. This show is sponsored by Human Conversation. <laughs> awesome. Welcome, Barry. Hey, Mark. Hey, Jeremy. Great to be here. And let's have some meaningful conversations then. I feel pressure now. <laughs> What did well, you think about Jeremy's research about bad driving being genetic, possibly? <laughs> yeah, as you said, the sample size is small. As as someone who who deals in big data all day, every day, um, we we you certainly have a, a place for error there. But of of course, I I think even I I find it interesting that they actually found a genome, right? That 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 was responsible because we we certainly learn our behaviors from previous generations, right? And I and I do think that we we do pass on some of those bad habits uh, to our kids as well when it comes comes to driving and um and 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 we learn it from other drivers as well so i think there's an awful lot of of things that make us bad drivers but i think in in in, in re reference to our pre-chat mark i think recognizing that you're not a great driver puts you in in a better place than most drivers um because we're all terrible drivers this is, i have the statistics in my favor to prove that Awesome. Uh, what, well, one quick thing on that on that study with the tiny sample size, um, that that particular uh, area of the genome is actually responsible for supporting neuroplasticity, which is really interesting as well. Which is how our brain can kind of reprogram pathways and and that sort of thing. So anyway, I don't want to dive too much in, into that. Let's talk about our carryover question because uh, Barry, what we like to do is kind of thread these shows together, thread these episodes together uh, in, in an interesting way. So we had Tori Smith from Endiotics who has PillBot, you swallow it, you know, the pill goes in your stomach and you can do diagnostics. I know you're not ready to do that yet, but his question was really interesting for anyone building something new that is different than the existing things that are out there. So his question was when things get tough, like when things are difficult, which they tend to be in any entrepreneurial venture, 
why don't you quit? <laughs> That's what my wife keeps asking me. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? It's a, it's a very interesting question, right? And and there's there's a couple of layers, and I think it, timing is a big part of it in in terms of the it, the answer would have been different ten years ago as it would have been ten years prior to that. But I'm naturally an optimistic person. So I, I always feel like I can come out the other end, I think is, is one key part. And I think you need a sense of optimism or you'd never start a company. But, you know, as I say, 20 years ago, it was survival, right? Um, and that, that changes. 10 years ago, it became about, you know, making an impression on my kids, right? And, and, and you know, that they'd see that, that dad worked hard and he, he you know, he, he, was, he was going to do something interesting every day. And I think now in this stage of my life, what really motivates me and keeps me going is impact, right? And, and the, the, you know, what we're going to talk about today and what we're building here at Provisio, that's really about impact. And I think that for me is why I won't give up. This is a tough industry. I'm in the auto industry. Um, it's a tough industry, right? These, these guys are all fighting for survival. So you, you got to have some thick skin, but when you have a mission, and that mission could have a, a pretty big impact on humanity. My, that that's I think what keeps me going. And good answer. And this certainly what you're doing could have a big impact on humanity. So, so so there's a note here. Tell me tell me about the catalyst that that was part of the inspiration for for creating this this new system related to you in an automobile accident. Well, I've, I've been in a few, right? And 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 I guess for, for context, I've been building uh, sensor systems and things like that for for over twenty years now. But why why did I go at the automotive one again? It was it was two parts. Um, I, I, primarily, the technology we've developed it would have been used in aerospace um, and a lot of type of defense type applications. Um, and, you know, you reach a stage in your life where you go, well, that, that's nice and all. And if there's lots of money in that sector, but, you know, could I be doing something a, a little more impactful? And there's nothing like a car crash to concentrate the mind. So I, I had a car crash uh, back in, in uh, two, early 2019 um, after selling my previous company. And I think I got a little bit of a shock, as you do. It's not a very nice experience. I've been in them before, but unusually, I didn't go home and you know shake myself to sleep um, and and think about maybe you know how I could be a better driver and things like that. I actually went home and just started working on. Hang on, that accident should have been preventable. I I, I should have been able to foresee that. Well, why wasn't I? And I started looking at all the all the things that humans are bad at that, that lead to us crashing. That l led me down a rabbit hole. And, and when I came out of the rabbit hole, I formed a company. And uh, it's a, you know, it was a, over a six month period, but I just couldn't let it go. And, and the more I looked at it, the more um, I thought, you know what, we, we, we could do something really interesting here. And by we, I mean, I had to go out then and talk to the smart people um, and recruit them. But, but that was that was definitely a, a, a really important moment in why I went with Provisio and not something else. I think it's um, not the first time we've heard that a personal story that drives that will to just keep going at all costs. So um, before we get into Provisio, there's I was going through the website, I was looking at the tech and there's quite a lot of terminology that I don't, I'm not familiar with. I don't understand. Obviously, AI is there. I get that. Could I just ask you a few tech questions just to set the scene for our listeners so we kind of know what you're talking about when we get into how it's solving the problem? Um, sure. I mean, I, I, I don't know if you're familiar, Joan, with L1, L2, L3, L4, L5, these layers of automation in cars and how that impacts what you're doing so maybe if you could talk through that and 5d perception yeah absolutely and and you know what the, um, the two things you mentioned uh you have a you have a very good excuse for not understanding them and and the first one being the levels of autonomy and the, the reason i say that is because they don't make a lot of sense they were they were 
developed before we truly understood the complexity of the problem. And really what level level zero is basically a car with no sensors that you just that drives um, you know by human uh, control all the time, right? And level one is where you start to you know add things like cruise control and things like that, right? Level two is where you start to you know allow but hands on eyes on driving, but you're now moving to a stage where you know you've got uh, lane centering and adaptive cruise control. So a little more automation in the system and automated emergency braking in a you know a dangerous scenario, but. Then here's the problem, right? Because it goes to level five, but it's a bit like that Microsoft progress bar that moves to a certain point and you go, I talk 20% of the way, but I've been sitting at 20% uh, for, for the last couple of years. And that's, that's actually what's happened. Level three is where you've hands off and eyes off driving, right? So that, that's quite a leap. So you hear an awful lot in, in, in this sector and out there in the news about autonomous driving, but 99% of automotive companies and uh, in, in the space are still stuck on level two. And the reason is it's so significant. You're, you're, you're talking about changing an entire industry. When you go to taking your eyes off the road and taking your hands off the wheel, something else is responsible for driving now. Up on, you know, while my hand's on the wheel and my hand's on the pedal, I'm, I'm, I'm in charge here, right? I'm responsible, my insurance is covering me. So it's a, it's a monstrous leap. Level four then is where in uh, certain scenarios, the vehicle's fully autonomous, right? Are in certain regions, for example. So that's where you've something like a Waymo vehicle that we're all aware of that, you know, San Francisco can drive fully autonomous um, without a driver, uh, but in that area, right? It, it, can't, it can't move up the road. And then, as you go towards level five, um, that's that's where it's ubiquitous autonomy. The vehicle can drive anywhere it wants with with no driver. In fact, there's no steering wheel, right? And that that's really where you're going. So they're they're not equal, right? I think the the the, tra the gulf is to get from level two to level three, and then everything gets a bit um, a bit easier from there. I hope that makes sense. No, it totally does. Um, question to kind of root this in to what people see on, on TV in between the shows they're watching. It's something called a commercial. Um, a lot of people pay to avoid them. Some people have to watch them, but Not there's one, one in 20 years there, there, there's one, I can't remember if it was GMC Chevy. Uh, I don't remember whatever, but there's the, the, we will, you know, we will rock you queen song and they're going don't don't like doing this with the hands off the wheel in the truck. Is that, is that two or three? Where are we at with that? Uh, it, it depends. How long are they keeping their hands off the wheel? <laughs> I, I mean, there's a quick cut, quick cut of them doing it for maybe, you know, three seconds, but largely they're telling the story of maybe yeah. the whole trip into the mountains could be done with a looped. We will rock you. I don't know. Yeah. So that, that, that's level two in the, in the main, right? Because if you're, you've taken the hands on and off the wheel, you can do that with level two driving systems but your eyes are still on the road and, and things like that. And it, it's different rules in different countries, right? So what's a, you know, in Europe has different rules to the United States, but true level three, those hands aren't going on and off the wheel. And those, those eyes aren't focusing on the road as in, in certain scenarios. So it's, a, it's another leap. So like, like everything, it's a new flavor of level two. And you'll hear people talk about level two plus. Um, and, and really that's because, it's a bit more level two. So the guys that allow you to take the hands off sometimes, that's a bit more than the guys who, you know, never let you do that. But again, um, the, the descriptors are bad, I would say, you know, using these levels. If I lived in California, could I buy an L5? Uh, no, you can't buy an L5 anywhere in the world, um, just so we're very, very clear. Um, in fact, I'm not aware of any L5 programs in the world. I mean, Waymo is is number one in autonomy, you know, it, it, it just absolutely ahead of everybody. Um, but they're, they're level floor, four, right? Or maybe level four plus because now they're in multiple cities. But it, it, when Waymo will be at level five when... They can cover the whole United States and not have to worry about about anything, right? Whereas now they're they're in 
pre-mapped environments that they they understand so i would consider that level four okay so the one the one interesting thing about frameworks like this is you know one of our so we have a book club and one of our books we read uh the nexus by julio tino and uh, he talks about grounding new things in the old way of doing things right to make them relatable so frameworks can be interesting in that regard sounds like this one is a little it's a little lacking and a little confusing too but like where where are you guys headed related to your work and let's talk about some of your specific technologies that you're that you're developing yeah no that's that, that's a good segue into into how we see the world i guess so we don't see the world in levels of autonomy that's that's not how our customers do of course right they have to they have to sell and they have to adhere to certain uh criteria but we decided to look at the problem maybe from the different end right and what i mean by that is it, it helped having a background in aerospace right so if you go to nasa tomorrow with a new technology right and you say you know i want i want to bring this technology to space and uh but now it's made from a uh, uh, uh material that obviously can't go into space that's the end of the conversation with nasa right but if you think of the autonomous vehicle industry that's exactly what they did they were like well we can drive it around in circles on a track uh if it rains we have to pull it in that that to me it just wasn't the path to go here so we said let's look at it from the opposite side let's focus on the hard bit first right and it as it happens the hard bit in autonomy is also the bit that we as humans find hard right and the the, the edge cases they're often called in, in in robotics and really these these are the things that lead to crashes and things like that so we started looking at well what level of sensing would you need to actually solve the, the driving problem, stop us crashing into each other, stop it, give people the foresight to prevent crashes. And if you solve all of those, well then autonomy becomes a byproduct because then it becomes an ethical question. If I can prove that my sensors and softwares and brain are better driver in these scenarios than you are, then that to me is a much more compelling case instead of telling the world, hey, we're going to kick all truckers out of trucks and just have them autonomous to save money. That that to me wasn't interesting. So that's kind of how we looked at it. And that's where 5D perception and conscious Mark asked a while ago, what the hell is 5D perception? And it, it is an abstract term, but it came from that. It was basically to solve the problem, you need to be able to see the whole world and understand the whole world in 3D, right? So that's three dimensions we all understand. The next dimension is range and velocity, right? So I can see the world and like uh, human eyes, we, we, we can see a car coming towards us, but we actually have to guess what speed it's coming at. And we've got to guess what distance is at. Make a, uh, then make a guess of, can I get out in front of it? And we often get it wrong, right? So you have to understand that fourth dimension. You have to understand the range and velocity of all objects. And the fifth dimension, that's our abstract term. That's the understanding whether you call it AI, whether it's machine learning, whether it's digital signal processing, but making sense of all that data. That 3D object is a car. It's moving at this pace. There is a pedestrian about to step out. There's going to be an incident. That's the fifth dimension. That's that understanding. So that's how we kind of flipped the problem on its head and said, well, let's focus on solving the problem and then in those scenarios and that's why the levels go out the window right because actually you will have a car that will jump from level four to level two or uh, you know it, it, by those definitions at different times depending on the scenario so i'm here in the southwest of ireland in shannon right and um you may have heard the rumors but we get a little bit of rain here right we also get quite a bit of fog right and so in a foggy environment for example I can see about 10, 20 meters if I'm lucky, right? And, and on, a, on a nice morning here, our sensors can see 600 meters in that same fog. So in that scenario, the vehicle should be driving itself, not, not me. I can see 10, 20 meters. What use am I in that scenario where the vehicle can see 600 meters? So we can make much better decisions. So suddenly in that fog situation, I'm it's gone to level four. But when the fog lifts, the statistics say I'm still better now in good conditions. I'm a better driver than the, than the machine. So therefore, we work together and it becomes level two. So that that's kind of just a, a slightly different way of viewing the world as we see it. I love going. I, 
just playing on that though in the future is there a point when ethically you're never better than the machine at driving and absolutely therefore... absolutely that that's what we're going for right but then it becomes a it, it doesn't become a debate at that stage that it becomes statistical data i have the i have the evidence i'm better i'm better than the human driver in this situation which is kind of, I think, where the industry got it wrong in, in the beginning, right? They kind of, and then people started having the ethical debates, you know, the trolley problems often brought up, you know, do I mow down the little old lady crossing the road or do I uh, swerve and hit the kids? Hey, how about we see the little old lady uh, a couple of hundred meters away and we, uh, and let's not kill anyone, right? And <laughs> and I think, you know, that, that it seems so, right? I mean, we're laughing, right? Because it's, it, it just seems so bizarre, but it's so logical, right? That, that that's how you would approach it. So you need better perception. And that that's really what we're all about in, in Provisio is to build that. Super, super interesting. So number one, I love that you're tackling the hard shit first. Like, I think that's that's very commendable and just saying, let's go after the big stuff. Um, and so understanding the world around you, yes, seeing what's out there, but the, the, the uh, range and velocity thing is interesting, right? Because we're all pieces and parts moving in that world. So that that makes a whole lot of sense. But having these sensors that can actually deliver the information that you need is is really interesting as well. I start thinking about in planes like IFR and VFR, like instrument flight rules, visual flight rules, like and and the the, the delineation of like obviously when you can't see and you're flying an airplane, you have to you have to go instrument flight rules. But um what are the key what are the what are the um give us a couple more examples of when uh, the tech that you're actually working on and testing and delivering, uh, what are those scenarios where it helps you make that switch? Yeah, absolutely. So there, 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 and there, there are hundreds, right? But just to kind of give some other examples, um, our, our backbone in our technology is radar and we're very radar focused. And the reason for that is there's loads, like cameras are on every vehicle and they will be. And we work with cameras obviously very closely. And then you've LIDARs was another technology that was developed. but LiDAR has a lot of the same weaknesses the camera has, right? And what humans have, right? So cameras uh, you can see like a human can. So we can't see the vehicle in front of the vehicle, for, for example, in front of us. And we can't, you know, we can't tell, as I said earlier, the exact velocity. So a very uh, interesting example of how we use the technology is radar that millimeter waves, right? And they, they literally bounce up around the vehicle and then onto the next one and onto the next one. And those waves send back the signal on the image of the vehicle, but also it gives you the, as I said, the range of velocity. So you know what every vehicle is doing. So when you have multiple vehicles ahead, humans can't tell what's going on a couple of vehicles ahead. The cameras can't tell, the lighter can't tell because of shadowing but we can, the radar can. So for example, we've all been there, especially in country roads in, 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 in lots of different countries where you're stuck behind someone and you go to make that overtaking maneuver, but you're blinded to the vehicles coming towards you as well. The sensors can see all of that. And these are some of the early implementations we're seeing with our OEM partners, where it gives you a gentle nudge as a driver. So you go to make that overtaking maneuver, it stops the wheel. Then you see that car go past you and you go, oh, I'm so glad that there's artificial intelligence built into this uh, that saved me from myself, right? And now suddenly I trust the robot, right? As opposed to when we actually use hands-off driving, humans get very nervous. They've done the measurements on our brains. Like when we hand over control, we're not really good at it. It's why people are scared of flying, even though it's so safe. So when the machine starts to save your life on a regular basis like that, that's where we think that that impact would be significant. Another one that I can give you is more than 50% of car crashes are rear endings, right? So why do you drive into the guy in front of you or the guy behind you drive into you? It's because of lack of foresight, right? If you could have seen that something was going to happen, you wouldn't have hit them, right? And so in that scenario, we can see the car, let's say six, eight cars ahead of you we can see that car start to decelerate before his brake lights come on, right? That's that's what the technology allows you to do because we basically got his exact velocity. And so normally you have to wait till the car in front of you use brake lights. So you can imagine the latency in that, right? It's one car, two cars, three cars, four cars, and then bang. So if I'm able to see that so much earlier, I'm able to take preventative action. So I'm able to slow down in a manner that the guy behind me doesn't hit me either, right? So those are two kind of just 
very simple type scenarios that if you've the right sensors, you're absolutely going to be better than a human driver. If you, one of the experiences I've had of late, I didn't know this was a thing, so I actually looked it up, it like phantom traffic jams. And the, the secondary effects of what you're talking about, sometimes, unfortunately, this technology saves lives isn't enough to, to move the needle to get people to act. But if you say this technology can save 1,800,000 $1, billion a year in man and woman hours, then everyone goes, okay. And actually removing traffic jams and making traffic flow quicker, more smoothly is a massive value add to society as a whole, as on top of removing all these unnecessary deaths, isn't it? So that's another. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we, and smart city applications, governments are getting involved heavily. There's so much investment going into smart cities and, and our technology is being adopted by a number of companies in that space because it's not just what's on the vehicle, but actually being able to watch intersections and, and, and adjust in, in real time to what's actually happening and giving real time alerts and actually able to do it through V2V technology where you're able to send signals and V2X to warn vehicles in advance as well about different things, about managing traffic flows. It, it, it's incredible and you're right, it's not just restricted to the vehicle, it's around that. The other thing that people kind of underestimate about like outside of the human devastation of you know, road deaths and, and, and that side of things. It, you mentioned it, people are very motivated by cost, right? And the cost to the global economy from car crashes is, is incredible. In the, in the developed world, it's about 2% 2 to 3% to of GDP is lost to car crashes because of ambulance services, because of all the things, you, the, the uh, impact in, in terms of efficiency efficiencies on the road, all of those things. So those are real numbers that have been measured. In, in emerging economies, it's even higher, right? It goes up to, to 5%. So those are trillions, right? That That's the cost you're getting into to the global economy. So there's an economic factor. And, and by the way, I learned it probably a little too late. I didn't know the automotive industry as well as I should have when I started the company. I learned a little too late that that the economic factor do not ignore it because it matters an awful lot because of course automakers want safer vehicles right but they also want to survive so if you can't build this type of technology at a price point that it can go on every vehicle you're not going to have success so i can you know i can be you know i'm so clever and i've got the best sensor I, i'll have no impact on road debt or car crashes if I don't have the best sensor that every car maker can access. So economics is unfortunately probably the key driving factor of the rollout of the technology. Yeah, economics and as you as you referenced to supply chain and availability and how easy it is to pull this stuff in. The thing that I always tend to think about with a lot of these new technologies is you know, you have this great sensor that that operates uh, from a radar perspective. So it's deeper information. It's based on range and velocity and predictive technology. So great information is getting captured and a lot of information is getting captured and it is processed in a way to make real time decisions in key critical moments, right? So I start to think about with all of this information coming in and landing in a car, how, how does that affect, you know, data storage, data access processing? Like what does that do to that side of the equation? You love that yeah. side of the equation, Jeremy. <laughs> 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 no, you, you're you're a hundred percent right, right? It's 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 all about the data, but it's about as much uh, it's as much about the the, uh, the data and the volume of it as the good data. So filtering the data is every bit as important as collecting the data and collecting the wrong data. So we we spend a lot of time focused on that. So for example, cameras that's where they're weak, right? Because they they you know you can unlock it incredible amount of semantic data from cameras, which is really interesting, but they also take up an awful lot of bandwidth, right? And they, they, they take up an awful lot of storage and it can be very hard to discriminate the interesting part of, of the ca camera image. Radar is actually an awful lot better at that. So when you put the two together, now you can start to bring in filtering on the edge, because this is extremely important and where edge compute becomes very important so that you're only collecting important data. So companies that have been very successful in this space is people like Mobileye, right? So who uh, have a, a AI chip on camera. 
And what they're really good at doing is they, they basically got a map of the entire world that they've been able to gather from their customers driving around, right? And, and basically that's because they were able to discriminate the good data from the bad data, right? And that was, and obviously because it's a very specific thing of a map and what's, you know, the road edges and, and uh, positioning yourself off of maybe some signage, that was a, a, a clear thing that they could discriminate against. With our technology, now we're able to actually just gather the data from incidents. So because of the things I talked about, what and and you start to think about, well, let's say the computer tells you to slow down. So that's a big part of the technology. Something comes up in front of you and says, slow down. And if you don't, we start to slow you down. But then gathering that data is very interesting because why didn't the driver slow down, right? Or why did they override us when we when we gave them some prompts? So there's a huge amount of data that can be gathered from that, but it's good data rather than. And you often hear in the space of uh, automotive companies, uh, OEMs especially, saying we've driven you know 100 million miles of data or trillion miles of data. It's nonsense, right? Most of that data is useless. Right? Like, like most of that is the most mundane driving around in circles or going from, you know, mom's house to, to the shop, right? Like that, that, that's useless data. What you really want is the critical data. So when you focus only on the edge cases, uh, you start to get a lot of really good data because you're right, that, that, that pipeline is full. <laughs> There's not a lot of space on it, right? And, and when you put an NVIDIA GPU into a vehicle, you'd be amazed how quickly people like us start to fill it up, right? Because we all think our sensor is the most important. So that discrimination is a huge part. That's a, that's a, that's a ingrained rule in humanity. It's something called Jevons paradox. It started back in like the industrial revolution. The more capacity you have for something, the more we're going to fill it up. Right. And it's just this thing that goes, goes up and down, but that, well, so, it's just like a house, isn't it? You just buy stuff, fill it up, got to empty some space, put something else in its place. Yeah. I don't know, guys. I I I think LA's traffic could be sorted with just one more lane, just one more lane, and LA would be fine. <laughs> totally. No. So, so I appreciate your 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 answering that last question so succinctly. I think that so that so just to clarify, the data that comes in from radar is less bandwidth intensive than pictures and video, right? Yeah, exactly. You, you, you can imagine because it, it, especially with the velocity equation, right? I can discriminate an awful lot of things that I, that I don't need to gather. And then, and then also making sure, like you said, you know, getting rid of the data that you don't need and really getting the good data and feeding that into the decision-making machine of this, uh, of this chip that, that lives in the car. Exactly. Because the camera, if you think about how you train a neural net, right? So if, if you want to understand the, uh, even the velocity of other vehicles using a camera, right? You basically have to take a, a you know, a frame of the, of the visual and then another frame and the distance between the two vehicles. You then have to gather the time synchronized data from, from the vehicle, right? And you have to gather data from the CAN bus to understand what, you know, the acceleration that was on the Eagle vehicle, your vehicle, right? At, at that time. That's quite a lot of information just to find out if you've trained it well enough to understand the, the velocity of other objects, right? Whereas radar since World War II, that's what it's really good at. It's able to say it was at this exact range of velocity. So now I've taken away all of that and now I can just focus on, you know, what the camera is really good at, right? Which is unlocking the kind of semantic data, like where were the road lines? What what was the speed limit? I can read the road sign. Where you know what was it a red light or a green light? So that that's exactly you've got it in a nutshell. It's it's identifying what they're good at and and disseminating it down to that and using as little bad data as possible. Um, moving on from that, then. So you have all this data. You have the way you've described these systems. They're incredibly efficient. So. On the Proviso website, you're talking about OEM. So essentially, this is your technology that you Proviso can put in any car on the market. How is the car industry reacting to you and others doing what you're doing? Firstly, uh, um, yeah, that's the first question. And then on from that, how how you set up? Yeah, so the, 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 how, how they're reacting really well now. And, and, and I say that because... They, uh, everyone liked what we were doing from the beginning because we could do some really interesting stuff with, with with radars, right? And we could show them really good visuals and things like that. 
But as the technology has matured and as our, our kind of unique IPs have matured, the path to low cost access to the technology has become clearer. And that's why I'm saying now the reaction's an awful lot better because now they're kind of going, okay, this is accessible. This is something we can do. And another part of that equation is, and, and by the way, I got this wrong in the beginning where I over-focused on safety uh, without, without thinking about the cost and how important that is to them, right? Um, so, so, so I think that, that's where the reaction has been very good. The other thing that's happened, and you always need a bit of, you know, so that's the carrot, right? The stick. NHTSA, right, in the United States, the, the regulator in the United States is typically the United States has been behind Europe and, and the rest of the world in terms of enforcing safety regulations on cars, right? Because uh, Americans have a, a very strong um, opinion on cars, right? They, they love their cars, right? And, it, it, it's and they've, got, they've got no corners. And they've got no corners. That's true. That's so true. But certain things have happened over the last number of years that made NHTSA go, hey, we can't just, we can't just let this industry regulate itself. And they brought in a, a, a ruling just recently. And from September 2029, 20, every single vehicle that goes on the road in the United States is going to have to have a technology like ours. That's just, if, you know, whether it's ours or some uh, competitor, they have to. It's, it's now law. So it's FMBSS 127. It's very interesting. And it's an emergency braking um, rule. And it basically says at certain speeds, you have to be able to see a pedestrian walk out between two cars. Quite complex um, scenarios. Incredibly well written. Uh, it's a great step forward from a safety perspective. But of course, it sent the industry reeling, right? Because they were slow in adopting imaging radar. But now it's kind of like, oh, we need it. And I'm out there, to, and they're all, they all go, oh, God, that's going to cost me a, a couple of hundred bucks per vehicle that I'm going to lose for my profit margin. And margins aren't very high in automotive, as we need, as we know. But I'm out there saying, hey, guys, we've developed a, te a technique to do that and pass FMVSS without the complexity that you've been told you need for that. So I'm going with the right story to them right now where you have a headache. We've solved it, and it costs less than you thought it was going to. So we're pretty busy, I suppose, is one way of uh, putting it right now. Awesome. Fo Follow-up question on that. So from from this being something that you license and, and work with existing car makers to incorporate your technology into their vehicles, is it a is, is it a process of like, okay, we're going to figure out how and what these decisions and how the inputs and outputs go, but then translate that. How is it? How do you translate that kind of thing to the UX inside the car? That just seems like crazy complicated. Absolutely, and we we do we we solve that in the best way possible. We push it on to someone else to solve that problem um, because you can't be all things to all men. And also, you know, OEMs take very seriously how you as a driver interface with their vehicle. So they like to have strong ownership, even if they have a tier one, which are the, the big suppliers like Bosch, Denso, you know, big, big, big company uh, supplying the system. They have a very strong influence on what, what the user sees and how they interface with that vehicle. So what we do is we, we basically develop a ton of microservices, uh, you know, little modules, and that that and even in our AIs and our machine learning, they're all kernels. They're all little things, right? That build up. And what we do is we offer them as a library. And essentially, the it, it, so we license even on the uh, uh, you know software defined antenna technology we developed. We license that to a tier one, and they can build their radar based on our technology. We're very comfortable with that, with with none of the perception type software if that's what they want to do. And then we can work with their OEM on the perception side. So we build all these little microservices. We make them available. But I, I, they're almost like building blocks of, of what the system needs to do. And, and it gets rid of the kind of hard bit of dealing between the sensor and, and, and the AI. And essentially, they build on top of those and make those decisions. So because we all know OEMs all see the world and all the car manufacturers, they have a different view of the world. You know, BMW, it's all about driving, right? So, they, you know, they're not going to go straight to, hey, autonomous, here it is. You know what I mean? And that they, so that won't be the ad for them. So they'll make those decisions. And whether it's gentle nudges, whether it's things on the heads up display or whether it's pure play interventions, 
it, that will be their decision and we just build these little microservices so they might say need 10 things from us or they might need two and we're very comfortable with whichever one it is makes a lot of sense um can we see it do you think <laughs> I mean, before the show maybe you could give us a little tour of what's happening behind you everyone's seen the cars behind you any chance of that barry Ooh, I have to be I have to be very careful here, Mark. Let me let me see if I can uh, I can walk around a bit. Now, why I say I have to be very careful? Um, this industry is. I, I I worked in aerospace. I worked in defense. I worked in the space industry. Um, I thought those industries were secretive. My God, this this industry is so secretive. But I, let let let's go for a little walk around and see see how far I get before before someone. Um, knocks me. Don't out. put yourself in danger, so, Barry. Don't put yourself in any kind of. Uh... <laughs> It, there's no way I'm going to get knocked down anyway, walking around this place. So, so this is our, our HQ right in, in Shannon in the Southwest of Ireland. Um, and this is the uh, future mobility campus test bed. And this is where we've got a bunch of these really cool vehicles here. Um, there's a BMW here and a Jaguar Land Rover. And this is absolutely peppered with our technology, right? So the units tend to be bigger, obviously, as we're, as we're developing the technologies. Um, and then they get smaller as they get more integrated into the vehicle. So this is one of our, our bays here. You can, you can see the vehicles, you can see some very interesting other technologies in the, in the space as well. And then you can start to see the kind of future units that are sitting around here. And you can see that the technology just keeps, keeps kind of getting smaller and smaller. So this is where, you know, you can see our friends, uh, NVIDIA here as well on, on the side of the vehicle. So we work, we work very closely with NVIDIA. So that, that's the kind of fun stuff we're doing here. The lab is up here. I'm definitely not going to be allowed to walk in there because it's a secure environment. Um, but I can certainly uh, show you show you there's a little bit of activity going on in there. And this is where, you know, a lot of the software is uploaded and firmware onto the vehicles. And, and you've even got some friendly engineers, which is, which is great to see. And then in here actually is control center. So this is where we can when we do vehicles out on the on the roads here and and driving around uh, in China because this entire zone is a, a, a test bed right uh, beside the airport here. Um, so this is the control center. We can watch everything going on from here. You know, see all that data in real time, and and obviously that allows and obviously all the engineers can port to that at at any point. Um, so yeah, so that's that's a lot. And this is the boardroom where absolutely nothing gets done. So I won't even show you that. So yeah, so that that that's a bit of it there. And obviously we welcome yeah uh, you and your listeners to come down here and we'll give you a demo drive. We're we're the demo guys, right? That's what we we pride ourselves on. That we 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 take people. Oh, I have to get my cable caught there. Um, so that's interesting. This happened to me today. Um, but we pride ourselves on we take people for drives every uh, every day, right? And um, it's it's a really important part of what we do is showing the technology because that's that's the best way to get rid of the the nervousness that a lot of people feel around autonomy. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks for taking the time to walk through it. it our listeners always it. it, it seeing like things in action beyond just like as like a essentially a zoom screen like gives a little bit more of like wow look at all this really cool stuff they're doing and i want to call out a couple of quick no, things that is for us jeremy don't lie come on it is a little bit it is a little bit, a little bit for us um so one quick thought i love the gentle nudge kind of thing because yeah, because you know a lot of stuff we talk about here is even though it's like hyper technological it's still at the core is built on trust right it's built on establishing trust right so by doing that a little bit at a time then it's like i've been in this car for a while it's treated me right it's probably saved me from a big crash once or twice i feel pretty good about you know putting my hands up and and you know letting it run in certain situations so i think that's amazing i, I know we want to be mindful of time i want to i want to ask you so you deal you uh you navigated a question from our previous guest very well and this question can be on any topic anything you want um free reign like what is what is spinning around in your curiosity engine right now that you would love to hand off to our next guest oh that's interesting and maybe i'm going to almost pass the ball on what what i was asked which i thought was a really really cool question it brought me to that place of now i'm in the stage of my life where i'm thinking of impact and um i'm going to be quite morbid for your next guest 
and ask ask them what will be their legacy when they're gone what 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 will the world say great question memento mori right mark yeah, yeah. Jinx. The, barry that came up in one of our other books we were reading clear thinking by shane Parrish, and it talked about you know legacy and you know uh, memento mori and that sort of thing well barry this has been a fascinating yeah. conversation i feel like i understand what you were doing uh so much better than uh than i did when i when i when i first kind of dove into your stuff that you you very succinctly kind of ran through everything the, the the takeaway for me on this one is 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 the radar technology and the ability to actually get the right data in the into the car at the right time to transfer that into real-time decision making and I, and I and i think that's amazing mark any closing thoughts on your side before we kind of do our formal outro yeah. so last week me and you especially me raged against the <laughs> apple ai machine and we, and we i was particularly disappointed almost disgusted on how the ai was was doing things which was so moronic so unnecessary so detrimental to the human condition and then being packaged and sold as a lifesaver and then we speak to people like barry today and the technology is being used. The AI is being used to save lives, to change the dial and to do interesting, important things. And that fills me with joy. And it wipes away some of my anger against the people who are using it for such, such surface level um, improvements. So, well, here's, yeah. here's the irony in that is that you know i drive down the road all the time and i and i see people like with their heads in this like 55 miles an hour heads down yeah. looking at this and it's like all right here's the thing we're not gonna we're not gonna get people to stop doing that unfortunately yeah. it sucks but we are not gonna wholesale convince everybody that if they don't stop looking at their phone while they're driving you know they're gonna kill somebody but if we create a technology that that offers another solution to that, I think it's amazing. And I think what you guys are doing is awesome. And I can't wait to, to see this like sprinkle out uh, into the world. Um, thank you so much, Barry, for joining us. Yeah, guys, it's thank been you. an absolute pleasure. So much fun. Thank you. Thank you. Again, Disruptors and Curious Minds, this episode has been brought to you by Human Conversation, Meaningful Human Conversation. If you'd like I, to- I heard a rumor that next week's show is going to be brought to us by Vinyl. Potentially, potentially. But if you need to learn more about meaningful human conversation, find someone else in 3D, approach them, ask them a question, and really listen. So uh, next week, actually, we might, yeah, we, so we've got this book club, guys. Uh, if you haven't done the book club yet, we read books, we unpack them, we'd love to read them with you. We're reading Michio Kaku's um, Quantum Supremacy right now that talks about the implications and potential of quantum computing. We're learning about it bit by bit and uh, you know, learn about it with us. If you're not a book reader, let us be the book readers and you can listen to the show. So uh, Mark, closing thoughts and we'll get out of here. Tell them about the next book, Jeremy. Oh my gosh, you go ahead, man. You know more about it than I do. So on the book club front, we've decided our next book, it's gonna be the second book in our book series called Nexus. And this one is by uh, Yuval Noah Harari. The Nexus, that's gonna be our next book. So you've got a couple of weeks to get your orders in and come and read it with us. This book talks about the history of information networks yeah. as they run through society. So as you know, he's written a bunch of other books that that take us through history uh, and looking at different lenses through of history. This is gonna be fascinating because the Can't future wait. is information networks. That's all it's going to be, right? Electrical signals bouncing back and forth, working with each other to, to provide outputs and such. So anyway, my yeah, rant is done. Barry, thanks again for joining us. Marco, post some great notes where everyone can learn more about what you're doing. Um, be curious. Stay disruptive. Keep thinking on paper. Bye-bye. <laughs>